name's Hannah. I am an FY2 doctor currently working in Edinburgh um, and I'm just about to start a set of night shifts. So I thought it might be useful to bring you guys along with me and show you a little bit about what being a junior doctor on a night shift is like. So I'm an FY2, which means that I am two years out of medical school. So I've been qualified for just about two years now. And I'm currently working in the medical paediatrics department, which is the children's hospital. Um, so looking after children with quite a huge range of issues from kind of acute illnesses to quite complex um, backgrounds and chronic conditions. So I'm just about to head off now and hopefully you'll get to see a little bit about what it's like to be a doctor. Um, and I'll try and show you a few things that I'm doing along the way. See you in a bit. So I'm just back from Handover, which is where the team of daytime doctors and the nighttime doctors get together and have a chat about all of the patients in the hospital so that we have an idea of what's going on with everyone and what needs to be done overnight and people we need to keep a close eye on. Um, so we've had that meeting now and then we've just done a quick walk around of all the wards to make sure that everyone is settled and that there are no concerns from any of the nurses or parents or any of the kids themselves. But everyone seems to be behaving themselves and most people are already sound asleep. But I will get back to you if anything changes. So I've just been given my first job of the night, which is to take a little blood test from a five day old baby who's come in from home because their midwife was a little bit worried that they were having some funny movements at home. So she's five days old and otherwise in her very short life hasn't really had any medical problems. Um, and mum had noticed at home that she'd sometimes been having little jerky movements, which mum hadn't been very concerned about. But the midwife had seen them and had felt that she maybe just needed to come and get her looked over to make sure that it's nothing going on in her brain. So in case it was a kind of seizure um, or if there was any other reason for it. So since she's been admitted with us, she's been very well and we've actually not seen any of the, the episodes themselves. Um, but we're gonna take this little blood test just to make sure that there's nothing wrong with any of the salts in her blood and to make sure that the, the kind of acid base balance in her blood, so her pH is all normal as well. So I'll take you along to the treatment room in a minute and we can have a wee look at the kit that we need to do this little blood test. Um, we just do it with a little heel prick. So it's a little lancet that you click, which looks a little bit like when older people have diabetes and they check their blood sugars. Um, a lancet a little bit like that. And then we collect blood in a capillary tube, which I'll show you and run it through a machine. And it gives us a really quick result about what is happening in her blood at that moment in time. So I'll show you that in a wee minute. So I've just come into the treatment room to get all my bits together to do this wee blood test. And I thought I could show you them. So it's a pretty straightforward procedure actually. It's really easy to do um, as long as they bleed well. So these are the bits and pieces that I need. So you can see, first of all, we've got a a cleaning wipe, so that's just to clean the skin to make sure we don't introduce any infection when we're um, putting the lancet through and making the wee prick. And then we've got these little blue and pink lancets, so this pink bit just screws off and then you press it into their skin and press this wee beaver and that releases a needle which punctures the skin. And then in this little tube here, we have the blood gas tubes, which is what we use to collect the blood. So the blood comes off in sort of tiny little drops, um, quite a monotonous process. And we try to catch it in one of these little tubes. So the blood trickles in. You've got to be really careful. Um, it's harder than it looks because you can't get any air bubbles into the tube. Um, if you do, then the machine isn't happy and you don't tend to get a very accurate result. So you've got to be very careful to keep it nice and level and try to scoop up the little drops of blood uh, until this whole tube is full, which takes longer than you would think. And then once it's done, we've just got some cotton wool to hold on to stop the bleeding. But they tend to stop bleeding by the time you get enough blood anyway. And that's it, it's really straightforward. And then we take it to the blood gas analysing machine, which um, which is a big fancy machine where you push that wee tube of blood in, it sucks it all up, 
and it analyzes it really quickly just on the spot for you so in about two minutes you'll have all your results so it's really really useful it's really really quick and it gives you an idea of kind of how somebody or how a child is in the moment rather than having to wait to send bloods all the way to the lab and wait for those to come back so let's go and see how that goes so i've just taken that wee gas from the baby and i've put it through the machine and everything looks nice and normal and um, so that's really good and really reassuring for a mum that there's nothing kind of really worrying going on at the moment so we still don't have an answer as to why she is having these funny movements but at least we know that there's nothing kind of very serious going on um at the moment so still a work in progress but good news for just now so it's two in the morning now and i'm just coming back from prescribing some painkillers for a, an older girl who's i think 15 um, who had got some quite bad pain she is a patient on the cancer ward so she's got a blood cancer um, and she has some pain associated with a, a big line that she's got into one of her blood vessels called a femoral line so a line that goes into her femoral um, vessel which is in her leg and kind of in her groin area so it's quite uncomfortable for her so I've just prescribed her some painkillers and hopefully she'll get some sleep now because she was quite sore. Um, otherwise things seem to be relatively okay. I don't want to sleep too soon. But hopefully it will be a relatively quick night for the rest of the night and not too busy. So it's four in the morning and I've just been asked to go and do an ECG for a little boy who's come in with some problems with his electrolytes, so the different salts in his blood. Um, he's a little boy with Down syndrome and he's got quite a lot of things in his background, quite a lot of complex things. Um, and one of the things that's come up as being not quite right in his blood test today is that his calcium level is quite high. Um, so calcium is something that's really important for your heart to work properly. Um, and too much or too little calcium can mean that your heart can go into funny rhythms called arrhythmias. Um, so when people have a high calcium and other salts like that, then we often do a tracing of the heart called an ECG to have a look to see if there are any problems with the rhythm. So we've done an ECG that you can see here. From that, everything looks nice and normal, which is really reassuring. Um, and we'll just keep an eye on that for the rest of the night. He was a, a regular little four-year-old, so it was quite difficult to put all of the sticky leads on. Um, and then once all the wires were on, obviously he was tying himself up in knots because um, he didn't know he didn't know what was happening, and he was half asleep. So it took a wee while to get him still enough to get the tracing. But we've got it now, and everything looks good. So that's helpful. So I'm just heading now to see a teenage boy who um, the nurses are a little bit concerned about because he's woken up through the night and looks a bit short of breath, looks like he's working quite hard with his breathing, um, which isn't kind of the normal for him. Um, so the nurses just wanted someone to come and have a wee look at him and they think as well that he's just kind of unsettled and kind of just generally not himself. So I will go and have a look and see what we think. Um, I suppose when we get asked to see patients like this um, and the nurses have already told us what you know the kind of main problem is then we have to start having a think about what might be causing someone to be working hard with their breathing so there's quite a lot of things going through my head at the moment about possible causes um, for breathlessness so things like chest infections can make you breathless um, clots in the lungs can make you breathless being sore somewhere can make you breathless. Um, an asthma attack can make you breathless. Um, so there's quite a lot of things to think about. Some of them in the chest, some of them out with the chest. Um, so it's good to keep an open mind, but it's always worth, I think, when you're heading to one of these situations, just having a think about what you might find and what you might want to do. So I've just seen that teenage boy that I was telling you about who was a bit breathless. Um, so he was working quite hard with his breathing when I saw him. He was kind of having to suck in quite hard um, and looked kind of just generally uncomfortable and not quite himself. He's quite a complex boy. He's got a lot of neurological 
problems in the background and um, so he's not kind of an average teenage boy so he can't communicate with us very well um, but he was able to kind of point down towards his legs to tell me that he thought that that was what was hurting him um, and you could just see generally he didn't look quite right so he's had some wheeze in his chest previously and tonight he was wheezy again um, which would make sense as to why he was breathless it's possibly a kind of asthma type picture or sometimes when you have a virus in children you can get wheezy as well um, so we're going to give him some salbutamol which is like the blue inhaler that lots of people you know probably have or you might have yourself for asthma um, give him that medicine but through a nebulizer so you get a lot more of it into you faster um, and you get some oxygen with it as well just to help push things through um, so we'll see if that helps to open up his chest and relax all of the muscles in his um, respiratory tract to try to let the air flow in a wee bit better and see if that helps the breathing so we'll see how that goes so I've just been back to see that boy um, post nebulizer of the salbutamol who was a bit wheezy and short of breath and he's looking loads better so his breathing has calmed right down, his respiratory rate has calmed right down as well, it doesn't look like he's working so hard anymore and he's managed to go back to sleep so that's a really good result and hopefully that will tide him over until the morning and then we can have another think about whether he maybe needs those nebulizers a bit more regularly at the moment just to keep things clear. Hi guys, so that's me just arrived for night two, um, so I will keep you posted with what's happening. Um, just been to handover like last night and now I'm just doing a quick walk around of the wards to make sure that everyone's okay while the two registrars or the two senior doctors who are on have gone to A&E to see a new patient. So I'll keep you posted. So I'm just heading to do a job that you do an awful lot as a junior doctor on medical paediatrics, which is to do a wheeze review. So lots and lots of children have asthma, um, and so do lots of adults. But in children, there's another thing that often makes kids wheezy, and that's getting viral infections. So just things like common colds um, and really anything like that. So rhinovirus and enterovirus are the, the common two viruses that kids get. Um, which make them all snotty and have a cough when they go to nursery. Um, quite a lot of children are predisposed to having a bit of wheeze when they have that. So some children will get a cold and will will deal with it very well and some children will get a cold and will become a bit short of breath and a bit wheezy and sometimes need to come into hospital just for a wee watch. And to get some salbutamol, which is the blue inhaler, um, regularly to try to help relax things. So when these kids come in, we review them regularly while they're on their blue inhaler and we try to stretch the distance between the inhaler so that they can go for longer without needing it. And once they're able to go for four hours without needing it, then they can go home and continue it at home. So I'm just going to go and see a little 18 month old who has come in with viral induced wheeze, who's got rhinovirus and enterovirus and is currently getting his Subutamol every three hours. So hopefully when I have a wee listen to his chest, it won't be very wheezy. When I look at his breathing rate and his accessory muscle use, so how hard he's working to breathe, all of those things will be nice and relaxed and he'll be settled and not needing any oxygen. And if that's the case, then we'll be able to stretch him to four hourly and hopefully he'll get home in the morning. It's always a bit spooky walking around the hospital at night because everything's deserted. Um, Fortunately, most of the lights are on tonight, which is nice. It's always a bit scary walking along a pitch black corridor. Um, but yeah, a bit of a strange vibe in the hospital at night. Definitely doesn't feel as manic as it does through the day. So that's the wheeze review done. Um, and his chest was lovely and clear and he was settled and asleep and had really good oxygen levels in the air. So I have stretched him to four hourly inhalers and hopefully he'll get home in the morning with some steroids to take for a couple of days just to dampen down all the inflammation in his chest. So I'm going to go and get a coffee now because it's two in the morning and uh, fingers crossed it continues to be a settled night. I'm just heading round to the emergency department now to see if there are any new children who are waiting to be seen. Uh, and while I'm around there, I will maybe introduce you to one of the doctors who's working around there so that they can tell you a bit about what they do overnight.
Good morning, everyone. My name's Ben. I'm one of the pediatric emergency medicine doctors. It's 20 to 3 in the morning uh, in Peds a &E. um, It's my job overnight to assess every kid that comes into the department and see whether they can either go home or whether we need to bring them into hospital and have our colleagues look at them as well. Uh, so that means assessing them, um, doing some basic tests, um, and ordering special tests if we need if we need to um, and reassuring the parents of those kids that come in especially if they're very unwell. Morning! So it is about eight in the morning and I'm off to see who is hopefully my last patient um, and you can see that it's finally light outside it really is morning it really is almost the end of the shift so that's good um, so I'm just off to see a little girl on the cancer ward who has quite a lot of complex issues um, but the main thing that's troubling her this morning is that she's got too much fluid on board so she's what we call fluid overloaded um, so the nurses have been keeping a very careful chart of her fluid balance which is where they count everything that goes in so everything that goes in through her mouth anything that goes in through any drip she's got and anything that goes in through any feeding tubes and then we also measure everything that comes out as well. So all of her urine, her stool, um, and if she had any kind of drains or other things in, it would measure that as well, just so that we can see exactly what's going in and what's coming out and whether she needs any help um, getting rid of fluid. So it looks like she's quite positive at the moment. So there's more going in than coming out. So I'm gonna go and have a wee look at her and then probably give her a medication called Fruzamide which is, it's called a diuretic and it helps your kidneys get rid of fluid. And the best part of a night shift is when it's all over and you get to come home to see a beautiful sunrise. Um, so that's me done. I hope coming along with me on my nights was useful um, and it's maybe inspired some of you guys to think about being a doctor. Well, I'm gonna go to bed now. See you later.